in this section, we're going to be talking about reliability and validity, which are two absolutely key concepts in all kinds of research. Um, they are really the foundations of the conclusions you draw from the research. If you don't have reliability and don't have validity, then it's very hard to draw any meaningful conclusions from the research. So this is, is absolutely core. What I'm going to talk about is uh, describing reliability and validity and how we measure both of them, and then they have a relationship uh, to one another. So we're going to talk about that too. So let's start with reliability. Reliability is the consistency of a measurement or a measuring instrument. So if we measure something today, we want it to be relatively consistent over time and place, right? So we would like to see in, in a measure that, uh, you know, if, if I say that you're five foot six today, uh, two months from now, barring some major change, you should probably be five foot six. I would hate for my, my measuring stick to be made of rubber and stretch and not be very consistent. Um, we need some way of, of measuring things that is consistent over time. So uh, that's one way we think about uh, reliability. The other way we think about it is do we have consistency within our measures? So in other words, as opposed to my measuring stick stretching between the, the first time that I, I, me I measure your height and the second time, uh, are all the inches in that five foot six inches the same size, right? So is there consistency within the measure? that says this is a reliable tool, it's one I can trust and basically say the differences I might see are due to something other than uh, a confound in my measuring instrument. So we want that uh, to be consistent. And I'll talk a little bit uh, different ways that we look at and assess reliability. There are really three that we're going to concern ourselves with and these are kind of the, the, the big three and the primary ones. So first one is test retest and it kind of goes back to the example I just gave. If I give you uh, a, an intelligence test today and I give you another one in two months, I would hope I get the same score because intelligence doesn't change much over time or it's not supposed to, at least after you get out of out of high school, right? As you're growing, it does change a bit. But in adulthood, it's it's relatively constant. So if I have a good intelligence test, it should give me the same result for you uh, time after time after time, right? And so it's a simple correlation. And remember, correlations actually go from uh, minus one to one. But in this case, we always assume they should be positive because I'd really hate to get a negative measure on a, on a reliability. That would be a real problem. But we're looking for a pretty strong correlation of about 0.7. So 0.7 isn't chosen randomly. It's where half of the, half of the variability in the score from uh, the second measure is due to the first time you measured. So the 0.7 is a, is a, a rough rule of thumb, but that's the one we use. You can go a little bit l less on that if the time frame between the measurements is longer. So if you look at uh, some personality measures uh, and, and some dimensions within personality, not, not the measure overall, but certain dimensions within personality may change over time. So if I give you a personality measure today and it says, uh, you know, that uh, you're, you're very democratic, you seek out input before making decisions, well, it's one of the dimensions, and I give it to you five years later, it may change a little bit. I may not be able to get to that 0.7. Two years later, I might not be able to get to that 0.7. Two months later, I should be able to get to that 0.7, or else I don't have a stable measure. So there's some thinking in what is the construct I'm measuring, and what's a reasonable time to expect that there not be a change. Um, when, I'm a developing, when I'm developing a measure, and I'm trying to ass assess that reliability, I'm usually going to put it at a safe spot, somewhere, you know, if I think about that personality measure, maybe two months, and say, okay, there's repeatability over two months. I have uh, a measure that's stable in and of itself, and uh, anything else that happens, you know, that, that's due to outside sources, not the fact that my measure's changed. So that's test-retest reliability, and we're, we're looking for that, you know, stability consistency over time. Internal consistency is the next one, and this one is kind of what I talked about, you know, are all the inches the same size uh, on my measuring stick? And uh, traditionally, before there were, uh, you know, lots of high-powered computers all over the place, and I do remember those days, uh, <coughs> you would have to either do this by hand or do it by a very slow uh, VAC system that SLU used to have. And there, you would do split half by taking half the items from a measure and adding them up and coming up with total, and taking the other half and adding them up and coming up with total, and see if they correlated with one another. So I could take uh, a test from an undergraduate uh, class 
you know, multiple choice test and say I'm going to take all the odd numbered questions and all the even numbered questions, add up the totals and, and, and correlate them to see if they would correlate. And again, 0.7 is the, the, the preferred cut here. And here it's actually, uh, it is the cutoff. Less than 0.7 on internal consistency is, uh, is really not acceptable because you don't have that time variation in there. So anyway, I could take the first half and the second half and correlate them together. And traditionally, it was done odd even because you didn't want uh, you know people to be tired at the back end and do differently than they were at the front end. Uh, and you would make those correlations between those two. And if you got a correlation, so back to the, the undergraduate test, if there's a strong correlation, 0.7, between those two halves of the test, essentially what you're concluding is the test is about the same information. Right? So if the student has relative knowledge to the test or doesn't relative to the test, they're a good student or a bad student, uh, the two halves are, are tapping into that same underlying construct of have you learned the key information from this class. So split half is a way of, of assessing that internal consistency. Chromebox Alpha, after a, a number of years and uh, you know some mathematical computations and uh, some some pretty good uh, statisticians, uh, they figured out a way to uh, estimate what are what is the average of all the possible split half combinations. So the odds evens, the front back, the the first quarter, third quarter versus the second quarter and the fourth quarter of a test, and took all possible com com combinations permutations of those split halves and say, well, what's the average? So again, I'm still answering the same question of, are these items, are these questions tapping at the same information? Are they tapping at the same underlying construct? And that's Cronbox Alpha. And that, again, acceptable level is 0.7. There's actually an upper limit on, on split half and, and Cronbox Alpha as well, and I'd even say alternate forms. And that's about 0.95. Because if it gets too high, then the conclusion is, it's not a bad thing. It's just you have a lot of questions that are a lot alike because they're getting responded to almost identically. So maybe we could make the questionnaire shorter and get just as good a result. So acceptable ranges 0.7 to 0.95. Alternate forms. This is about making a, a, a different form of a test. I'll continue on with the example of uh, an undergraduate class and a multiple choice test. I could give the first row in the class one test and make up another version of it with completely different items and give it to the second row. And then I could correlate the two of those and see if there's agreement between them. I'd usually probably do that within students. I give it to both of them, but that's neither here nor there for the moment. So what I have in an alternate form is essentially uh, a, a derivation on a split half because I made an item pool that's twice as big and took half the items and put them in uh, test form A for row one. And I took half the items and I put them in test form B for row two. And then I'm doing the same thing. I'm looking for a correlation between them. So that form of reliability, conceptually, it's say, uh, very similar to split half. But in practice, usually what happened was uh, you develop one kind of measure first and say, well, gee, we got to give it to them again. And we don't want to see the exact same question. So now let's create an alternate form or a second form of it. And let's just test and make sure that there's reliability between the two uh, forms. So that's. Uh, the three forms of internal consistency reliability. The last one down here is inner rater. And inner rater is, can I have two or more people who are my raters, judges, look at an observation and come to the same conclusion? So uh, when I did my dissertation, I did it on, on groups, and I was looking at group process. And I had two people uh, watch videotape who were blind to my conditions. They didn't know what whether they were the experimental condition or the, the control condition. And they would score, uh, if you will, here are some you know, uh, uh, pro-social behaviors, here are some or pro-team behaviors, and here are some non-pro-team behaviors in like five-minute time slices. So as, I went th as they went through, they would kind of check off. I saw, the, I saw this kind of behavior. I saw that kind of behavior in this five-minute time slice. And then I was able to compare, did each observer see the same thing relatively the same number of times? so that they were consistently looking for the same information. And that inner rater reliability tells me then that I don't have an individual bias, that the, the folks I'm using as raters or as, as judges are making the same conclusions from the observations in front of them. And the, the way to do that, uh, there are actually some, uh, uh, some other statistics that, that aren't 
terribly well known, you might see things like kappa um, or an interclass correlation that fit there. Uh, it'll, not as important to think about the statistics and, and how it's proven, but think about the concept that, you know, if we're using some of that soft data, some of those observational data, we still have some responsibilities to how we're interpreting it and using it and assessing its reliability.